Hello, I heard that question. So how do you narrow your many interests down to one? Um, the answer I'll give you is a bit non-traditional, but I cannot deceive you about what I did not say. Uh, I, I, I cannot tell you something I did not do. Um, or I cannot uh, try and introduce to you uh, worldly wisdom that did not work for me. So for many years, I thought the right way to do it was to try different things. And I, I did try quite a number of things. But what I have learned is that at the end of the day, the benefit of having a relationship with him is that he can tell you where he needs you to serve. And honestly, those have been the most profitable pursuits that I've undertaken. When you, in prayer or through the word of God, ask God, where should I serve? Where do you need me to stand for you? He will tell you, and you will be in a position to be there. That said, as you are listening to him, what I've often found is that if you are, um, you have to think about three things logically, even as you pray. Uh, the first thing you have to think about is, what, what are you naturally good at? What do people say you are good at? So for me, for example, uh, people say I'm very good at building trust, telling stories that build trust, talking to people, getting them to align. Even if they don't agree, they can align. Um, the second question you have to ask yourself is what do you enjoy doing? So even if people say you're good at something, it might be a broad word, but what do you really enjoy doing? And for me, I like solving problems. So if you give me a problem, a difficult problem to solve, especially when it involves human beings and human behavior, I like solving those types of problems. So coordinating people to solve problems, building teams to solve problems, leading teams to solve problems, that's what I like to do. So that's a second consideration. The last consideration is, you know, where can you create the most value? So when you think about it, where can you create the most value? Because we know that God doesn't want us to play small. He always wants us to play big like he is. So when you think about where you can create the most value at that point in time, you know, it's important for you to look with eyes of discernment. It's not the most popular thing, no. It's where you can create the most value. So it's not about following other people. And by the way, that answer especially when you take it from that lens, would differ from individual to individual, which as it should, because like I said, God has a, a special plan for each and every one of us. If you say, oh, because he went into fintech, I'm going to go into fintech. Umalula, umalule. <laughs> eh? As you say, so you may not survive. So it's better for you to seek God's direction and to ask yourself these three questions and then pray for direction for you to forge forward in the path that God has ordained for you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. I like how you were talking about, um, you know, being about God and waiting on God to hear his voice on what you should do and how to do it. And you always describe yourself as a faith-driven investor. As what you describe yourself as. So I want to ask, is this as a result of your growing up? Because we know you grew up in a faith child, you know, your childhood was filled with pastors, a pastor's kid and all of that. So was it as a result of you growing up as a Christian or you, you found out that it, if you put your faith in your work, because we have many people who are Christians and they like to separate, you know, segments. We like to segment things. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we are doing business here. Let us be business-minded. We are doing church here. Let's be church-minded. So how has this impacted your business? And, you know, give us instances. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I can't deny it it's, has its influence, right? Um, you know, the, the Bible says the, the seed of the righteous are, are blessed. And so I can't deny that. Um, that has had its influence. 
But I must also say that for me, I didn't start integrating my faith in my life. Understanding that it's one life that I have and that life belongs to Christ until I found Jesus for myself. Right? So it's not something that can be inherited. <laughs> you understand? It's something you have to discover for yourself. You cannot, your parents cannot know him for you. You have to know him for yourself and make that decision by yourself. Um, and what I have learned in t these 10 years is that, you know, God, God owns us. But more importantly, God has need for us. And it's not just in church. Many of us separate our church life from our life. And we think we can be one person on Sunday. And, and, and we give, like I said, we are, we are bribing God. In fact, we are, we, are, we are giving God, we think God is like tight. Tight is just recommended. It's actually 100% that belongs to God. But tight is just okay. Anyhow, anyhow, at least drop this 10%. It's the same thing with our lives. It's 100% of our lives. It's one life that you have, and that life belongs to Jesus. It's 100% of that life that belongs to Jesus. Now, there's also a need for a different understanding of what it means to do ministry. Uh, there's an understanding of ministry that is coming to places like this, sitting here. I'm not a pastor. I'm, I boldly, pa your pastor is in Lagos. He said it's coming on Friday, so <laughs> I'm not a pastor. Uh, but what I try to do in, in my work is to lift Jesus, carry Jesus there. And one understanding I have come to is that when, wherever, if you carry Jesus, and he, in, as in, he said in Philippians, I think it's Philippians 2.13, you allow him to will and to walk in you as of his good pleasure, you will find that you can never be less than number one. It's not possible. And it's not something I'm just saying. It's a fact. You know what I mean? It's just a fact. Um, I mean, by the grace of God, I lead my industry by far. Not even by, you know, I'm not comparing myself. And the reason is just because it's not me. It's not, it's not me that is doing it. Um, no one can do these things unless God is with him. I lead my industry by far because, I, because Christ in me is working inside of me to make these things happen. So I think a lot of Christians are missing out because the truth of the matter is that you cannot win in the world system because you are not part of them. So instead of you to fully utilize the small juju that you carry, <laughs> that is Jesus in you, you are also not maximizing that one. That's why they will spit you out. Because you are lukewarm. You are, not, you are neither here nor there. So that is the, the challenge a lot of Christians have. When they make that separation between business life and only give God their Sunday. Can we jam our hands together for that? Can we jam our hands together? Thank you so much, sir. I think somebody there has a question for you, sir. Someone over there has a question. Um, okay, uh, good morning, sir. So here's my question. For someone that has had successful startups, Andela, Flutterweave, and all, how was it easy for you to leave at those different points when you had to leave those um, 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 startups? Because Andela is doing well, Flutterweave is doing well, and then you now leave those things. And today, there's no Andela. They will still mention E and then mention Flutterweave E. So many of us, even in our nine to five jobs, the times that you become so clingy, how do you know when to move? Even if it seemingly looks very comfortable and then there's everything. You know, there are some nine to five. They'll give you almost everything, you know, flying allowance, everything, everything. <laughs> how do you know yeah. when to move to the next thing? That's, that's a great question. I think for me, there are three things. Uh, the first thing is that in this world, the only thing you can hold on to is Jesus. The moment you understand that, you understand life. So... I've never been one to, um, I mean, maybe earlier on in my career and in my faith, I was. But uh, I, I, I can, if, 
If there is need to leave anything behind, I leave it because it doesn't belong to me. That is always my mindset. If something doesn't belong to you, giving it to the owner, is it difficult? Eh? It's not now. It's not your own. You didn't give it to yourself. So giving it back to the person that gave it to you is easy. That's number one. Number two, um, in many of those situations, it was in direct obedience to the word of God and to, and to hearing from God, getting a leading from God. And God told me very clearly, even though at the time it looked like a crazy decision, that I have another assignment for you. Your assignment here is over. And so because of that, it was very easy for me to leave those things. Because the owner of the thing that gave it to me now came back and said, look, assignment has changed. Uh, if you're a soldier and your boss comes and gives you a posting letter that you are moving from Ilori to Kano, you, do you ask question or do you proceed to post? So you proceed to post, no matter what uh, the answer is. And then the third thing for me, the, 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 the one thing that God always uses um, to, to, um, to convict me when it's time for me to move on for something is strife. You know, the Bible says the servant of the Lord shall not strife. So for me, the moment I start to feel ill will, somebody feels a bit, someone, I just hand over everything and I go. And that is the example of our fathers. If you look at Abraham, he didn't fight anybody. When there was a problem, he just left it. Isaac, same thing. Three times, they told him to move. He just moved. <laughs> he opened well. They fight him after the well starts flourishing, and he moves. And you know, one thing I've learned over the years, it's become easier and easier for me because every time that I move in obedience, God honors my sacrifice. God honors my sacrifice and my obedience. So, for me, it's those three principles. It's just number one, understanding that everything belongs to him. The only thing you can hold on to is him. Anything else is, 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 uh, is like sand. It goes away. The number two is understanding times and seasons and assignments. In every season, God has a new assignment. It doesn't change, but the assignments can change. So understanding it and staying close to him so he can speak to you about what he wants to do. And number three, anywhere there's strife, if you are clinging on to something with your dear life at the cost of your mental health, at the cost of your peace, at the cost of your faith, just leave it. The servant of the Lord shall not strife. Hallelujah. Can we join my hands together? Do not compromise and leave it. God is in control. We so we have some questions here. For example, I have an idea, but I don't have enough resources to build it. How do I go about it? So, you know, there are many layers to this question, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, the first thing you have to have a clear understanding of is if it's your idea, that's okay. Uh, but if it's an idea that God has given to you, he will provide resources for it. But if it's your idea, <laughs> you may be on your own. In fact, even if you have the resources, it may not succeed. Even if you have the resources, it may not even still succeed. So the first thing is you having an idea and God giving you an idea are two different things. So first of all, you have to clarify that for yourself. Is this what God wants you to be doing with his life? Because <laughs> it's not your life. It's his, he gave you. That's number one. Number two, think creatively about resources. I think a lot of people get stuck on this idea of funding. When we were to start Andela, I mean, I knew this was, because I was already doing something. And then this idea came, and we had to implement it. I did not do, use any money to start. 
Before then, I had been chasing funding up and down. I did not use any money to start. I put out a tweet. The tweet had 700 people respond. I put out, uh, I, one of my, um, my, fr my older friends gave me her BQ to use for the interviews. After that, we used people's offices they were not using anymore, or we used a hub, all for free. My uh, team was already, they were equity holders, so <laughs> they did the training and the interviewing. I didn't spend money. Maybe I spent money on biscuits or buying food for the team, but I didn't go and raise money to start Andela. Even Flutter Wave, we didn't start with money. You know, even though we had some, we didn't start with money. Um, we started out, four of us, where we got a free space at Venia Hub. Uh, we started to meet, we started to meet. Then we had a client. And that client paid for us to build the first version. And then we now started building from there. So be more, be more creative about what you consider resources. Again, this is an area where hearing God will help you. Because, you see, Jesus, eh, he talks about fund management, he talks about anything. He, even then, he didn't, he didn't need money. He fed 5,000 people two times. No money. So you need to think more creatively uh, about where, what resources you need to start. Yeah. I'll stop there for now. Okay, so you spoke about being creative about the resources that you have. And when you were speaking now, you were talking about people giving you big cues, having this free resource here. And it tells so much about the relationships that you've built over the years. So how, to what extent does building relationships, how, how, to what extent has it told on your entrepreneurship success, the success of your businesses? To what extent has it told? That is one. And how can you build clean relationships, especially in this country today, clean relationships that would be profitable for you. Because even as we have talents, we have to be profitable with our talents. So how do we build relationships that will help us to be profitable in our talents? Uh, you see, the first thing is, the profitability of the talent is not for you. <laughs> it's for God. <laughs> so you have to be clear who you are serving. Because uh, the Bible says, all souls are mine, says the Lord. And for me, I find that every time I need men, God brings them. I don't, I don't strive. I'm not a social person. I don't go to people's wedding. I don't go. Very, it's a rare occasion I show up to. Very rare. Um, I don't have a lot of friends. I am a homebody. I stay in my house. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But... The one thing that God taught me early was the benefit of serving people. Every time I meet someone, I ask, how can I help? I never want to let somebody go without helping them. And it turns out that that helps when it comes to building relationships because if people know that genuinely you are looking for opportunities to serve, they are more inclined to help you. Um, so that's a very critical piece. But there's nothing you cannot do without men. Even God requires a relationship with men to accomplish his agenda on the earth. As powerful as he is. So if you think that you can survive without a relationship with men, you're a joker. It means you are not serious about God's mandate on your life. So you, you need men. Even God needs men. Who are you? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you need men. But how do you build relationship? Genuine service. In fact, there are a lot of people that will say, ah, that guy, he's so wicked. He's, he, can, he never lets you go except he collects a bribe. And I will meet the person and the person will not even dare ask. Even if he asks, I, can, I will tell him, look, I can't do that. But what else can I do for you? Oh, please, can you have dinner with my son? Oh, please, can you uh, advise my daughter's application? Can you recommend my son or my nephew for something? And if it's within my power, I do it. But again, and those relationships, they hold them so strongly. You understand what I'm saying? They are like, no, this guy must. Sometimes I want, why do you even like me like this? I don't want. 
You understand? But it's not me. It's Christ. He, and he owns the soul. So it has nothing to do with me. So I think that's, it's really important for people to understand that. What doesn't work, and I want to say it, is trying to monetize every relationship you have. Or trying to take from every relationship you have. That does not work. It does not help you build healthy relationships when everything is give and take. There are a lot of us that are exceptionally transactional. Somebody cannot ask you to do something. You say, how much are you paying? If that's how your life is, you have to beg for mercy and pray for deliverance because you cannot be lifted with that kind of attitude. Hallelujah. Thank you. Can we jam our hands together for that? I hope we are learning the power of genuine service. Genuine service is very important. We have a question there for you, sir. How can, how were you consistent? Like, how do you build consistency in your business? Thank you, sir. Fan, fantastic questions. Um, so, the, the thing that I always advise young people is don't teach what you have not practiced. It's, it's always dangerous <laughs> because... If you teach what you have not practiced, you, you, you yourself, you might not understand the ins and outs of it. And, you know, for our sister who asked that question, my suggestion would be rather than teach a course, why not find a way to build a service that gives the brand this, the productivity itself? So, for example, you say you know how to use AI. Instead of teaching me how to use AI, me, I don't have time. Kuku used the AI to do the work for me. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You will earn more and it is more productive. Because for you to learn something, the critical element is time and interest. And those things are in short supply. So a lot of young people, if they learn something for five minutes, they want to teach, <laughs> even in church. First of all, apply it to your life. <laughs> yeah? The Bible says we should not be hearers of the word, but doers also. So apply it to your life first. If you want to apply it on behalf of somebody, apply it. Then now somebody can then ask you, okay, how can we do this thing? You know? Um, and the second question is consistency. Now, our church model says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> so... If you have Jesus in you, you will be consistent. A lot of, I have some friends, they say they are ADHD, so they cannot maintain a routine. Uh, I, I, I sympathize. I know some people will say I'm ADHD or something like that, but the truth of the matter is if you have Christ in you, you will be consistent. You will. You have no choice. Because he will be telling you whatever it is you need to know to be consistent. Especially if you read the word of God. A lot of people rely on oh, hearing one tingling feeling or hearing one voice. But a lot of the word of God, if you live your life by the word of God, you will be consistent. There will just be things you cannot do. <laughs> you, just, you will just find out how your life is. There are just things you cannot do. No matter how attractive it is, you may not say, make noise about it, but you just can't do it. So my advice is you need to know him. You need to study the word of God. So that you can, you can achieve the mind of Christ and so that you can be consistent in all your dealings. Amen. Can we jump around together? I think we have one last question. One last question, please. Mm. Uh, what
work in a financial organization for a while, and because of my experience, I discovered that there is an opportunity where I'm working. So when I left the financial organization, I decided to found a company. But in the course of this business, I discovered that I have some losses because I, I don't really specialize. Because my background is in health, but because of the job, I got a job in, in the bank. But why I started the business, as I discovered that I need, I need some professional guidance. I did some courses, but still I still felt that there is this gap uh, in mentoring. And in a place where I find myself, because of location, I don't really have anybody you can confide in or run to in, in a place of question or assistance. That is one. And secondly is that I've, in a, that environment, we find it difficult to see people want to support business because they just believe in trading, just buy and sell. Now, to say you want to start a company they, are, they run on services. You find it difficult to see uh, support. How, how can you survive in that kind of environment? And what's the best option to, to survive in that, to make the business continue working? Yes. Um. So, I was looking for a Bible verse for you. Um, but I, I, I didn't have time to find it. But I want to... The first thing is you said... A lot of people have made mentoring an idol. I need a mentor. I just want you to, to know that the person that you need is not a mentor. You need the Holy Spirit. I, I really mean this because uh, so many people have... I'm not saying that mentoring is bad. Uh, neither am I saying that it's a bad idea to reach out to people that have gone ahead of you. But you need to understand that your path is most likely different. You are a unique person, and only God knows the plan that he has for you. So when people fetish, fetishize, I refuse to mentor people. I don't mentor. If you ask me a question, I will answer. But I don't mentor anybody. I don't mentor. At best, maybe as I grow, because me too, self, I'm growing in my own faith. Maybe I will disciple people. But mentor, I run away from mentorship. And the reason why is because people take other people's lives. What God has destined for another man, they copy it into their life. Plus the errors. Plus the <laughs> wahala. <laughs> plus, then you now confuse yourself. Yeah. So, I think you need to you need to build a relationship with the Holy Spirit so that when you have questions, and thank God, he's everywhere. He's not, he's not, uh, and you know what is very interesting? As you build a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you will be led, you will be led to mentors. He will tell you, go and meet this person. He will tell you what to do. That's what he did to Paul. Even me, I mean, sometimes people see my chairman at Flutterwave, uh, Baba Tunde Lemo. Some people assume that my father introduced us, but it's not true. My father did not introduce me to Baba Lemo. <laughs> I went to look for him because I, you know, I received a word. That, oh, this person will show you how to do it. Make sure he's your... It was now when I received that word, I started looking for ways to reach him. And then I now discovered that, okay, daddy had a contact, but I even, I think I went through uh, uh, Mr. Lawansin or somebody, Elder Lawansin or somebody like that, if I remember correctly. So what am I trying to say at the end of the day? God will lead you to your mentor and he will make sure that your mentor is also knows that you are his mentee. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Me, I won't, I cuckoo will not do anything without instruction from God. So, the only way I will accept mentor is if God tells me, this guy, I want to use him. It's your responsibility to work with him. But, I don't think we should fetishize it. Now, 
the practical point of the business that you are in, um, you need to understand that um, if you're not in an environment where something is being done, sometimes in business, it may be necessary for you to move to where you might be in an environment, a better environment. Um, and that's the sacrifice you have to make. Um, that is just common sense. You understand? Um, you may have to move. You, you have to ask God, you know, what does he want you to do? Is this what he wants you to do? But if it is, you may need to move to where God is asking you to, to be. Um, so I, I think it's really important that you, you also understand that as well. But I don't, I don't think that having a mentor is a limitation. No matter where you go or what you do, somebody, somebody must have done it first in an area. <laughs> you understand? Before, there's no reason why that person cannot be you. If that's what God has, has destined, there's no reason why it cannot be you. So, uh, th that there's no mentor in your area should not be a limitation. You don't need... A lot of us spend too much of our time. Instead of accomplishing God's will, uh, we spend time looking for approval. Uh, Paul, Paul, in one of the books, I think he started that and he said, uh, um, without speaking to to um, flesh and blood, right? I proceeded to do God's will. And that's how our lives should be. If you hear from God, you don't need additional approval, right? He's sovereign. He's the final authority. So try to hear from him and proceed to implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Please, we have a question. Someone has a question to ask there. You can go on with the question, please. Ask a question. Does um, losses in business um, count as a way of, um, how I call it now, ending your entrepreneurship journey? Because I, for one, I am an entrepreneur, but at some point I had to told that I'm um, in that dream and started a nine to five job. And even while I'm trying to do both together, it's almost like the entrepreneurship journey is not something that's gonna be fruitful or gonna yield anything. So my question is, I wanna ask if losses, counting losses in maybe your entrepreneurship journey, does it sound or does it look as a way of ending that dream? Then secondly, how do we, um, how do, Struggling businesses assess finance. I know you already mentioned that we shouldn't look at just the financial aspect. We should build relationships. We should um, ask um, help from one another. But in our Nigeria of today, even when you access funds from banks, the, loan, the interest on those loans are crazy. And at the end of the day, you, add, you actually accrue more costs than having anything at the end of the day. So my, I want to ask now, what do you advise for struggling businesses, especially in terms of finance, that are dreaming of having capital intensive businesses but do not have enough funds for it? Those are great questions. I will answer them very quickly. Uh, the first question, sorry. <laughs> the first question, I, I think the question was, um, uh, Losses in businesses. I think losses, in, it depends. And that's why it's important that, you know, one of the first things I always advise young people to do, and it's something I've had to do again and again in my life, is, is ju you're just better off surrendering your dreams to God. Because if it is in his plan, losses in businesses might be a way of just training you for a breakthrough. But if it is not in his plan, it might be a way of calling your attention to what he really wants you to do. There is no law that says that for you to serve God, you must start a business. It's not for everybody. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. 
What you should be concerned about is whether God wants you to start a business and why. If he wants you to start a business. But sometimes he needs all people in other places. He needs people, he needs people to carry him into nine to five. He needs people to carry him to politics. He needs people to carry him to government. He needs people to carry him to healthcare. He needs people to carry him to media. He needs people to carry him everywhere else. It's not just entrepreneurship, right? It's just like me now. Uh, for me to sit down and say, um, um, I'm not serving God because I'm not in ministry like my father. That would not be, that would not be true, Right? You can serve God where you are, but the most important thing is what is God asking you to do for him? If you don't get that right, you will continue to make losses. If you don't know him, you can't hear from him. And if you can't hear from him, you can't do what he wants you to do. There are some CEOs that are CEOs of companies. That's not what God asked them to do. I used to have a, a, a partner one thing my partner used to say struck me. He says, look, it is better for you to be what the world considers unsuccessful than to be what the world considers successful doing what God did not propose for your life. Because it's just misery. There are people everybody's clapping for. You go and look at their lives. It's just a mess. So, you don't want that to be your situation. So first thing, are you in God's plan? Now, if you're in God's plan, losses can teach you different things. The most important thing is, why did you make that loss? And you have to learn from it. For business owners accessing finance, if you're struggling as a business owner, you really have to ask yourself why you're struggling. Because finance will not fix your problem. If you're, you're struggling because you don't have customers, 95% of the time, finance will not fix that problem for you. If you're, there's rarely, and I, and I say this as somebody who engages thousands of businesses a year and maybe invests in about 100, I've, I am yet to see a business whose primary challenge is finance. Finance is typically... A secondary challenge. They probably have some more fundamental issue that they have not resolved. Maybe the capacity of the founder, uh, maybe their location, uh, maybe their understanding of the customer's needs. But finance, usually finance is a good problem to have. <laughs> right? It means that they have a lot of demands they cannot fulfill because of finance. And there are many ways of solving that problem. But if you are struggling, not because you have customers whose demand you cannot fulfill, but because of some other fundamental reason. Finance is rarely a cure-all, right, for that ailment in your business. So you need to ask God and talk to people to find out what is that ailment in your business. Take the feedback and then fix it. And then finance can follow. And usually, finance will follow, sustainable finance will follow sustainable deals and even if you take bank financing if you have a sustainable business you can always take it on the short term and roll it over roll it over so that it becomes part of your business cost um, i generally don't advocate taking loans personally but if that's what you need to do to keep your business alive that's fine So the question I have is this. We've heard of your of successes. We've read blogs, news of your successes. Andela, Flutter, we've now Future Africa. I want to ask, what motivated you into your entrepreneurship journey? That's one. And how did you deal with the struggles of your businesses? What motivated you to keep on going? Because I'm sure we are in successes. There are some failures that, you know, have probably happened once, twice. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how to get out of that, how to build on that. Yes. I initially came into entrepreneurship for the wrong reasons. Um, when I was, I was abroad, I went to University of Waterloo. 
I was there. I was, I was struggling as an entrepreneur. And, we, and they were the ones who introduced me. And why did I do it? At the time, in 2011 or 2010, there was a, a movie that came out called The Social Network. How many of us have watched it? Yeah, Social Network. So that was the movie I watched. And I was like, wow, this guy has been bullied. He has been thrown to the curb. All this, all this. And look at how he came out. And that was what drove me to be an entrepreneur. It was just pride and love of money. And I worked with that vision of one day I want to be Mark Zuckerberg. I worked with that vision and I struggled. I struggled. I struggled so much that I had to come back from Canada to Nigeria. <laughs> Re reverse Jackpa. <laughs> huh? Then after that, there was a business called Bookneto.com. It failed. We sold it for scraps. Came back to Nigeria, started Fora. We struggled. We pivoted two, three, four times. Eventually, I had this my encounter in December uh, fasting, uh, prayer and fasting program in 2013. And that was when God changed my orientation about business. Business is for service. It's for solving problems. So, it was only when I changed my orientation, I started to see success. Or what people call success. <laughs> right? Uh, it wasn't until I changed my orientation that, look, this entrepreneurship that I'm in is not for myself. It's for how do we leverage technology to make people's lives better. And that's what we've been doing since then. So, uh, trust me, when, when Jesus says uh, that you should take his body because it's light and drop your own, <laughs> which is heavy, so that he can give you rest, he means it. Because the body I carry now is not a burden for fame or for money or for status like when I started. For me now, I just do business to change lives and to save lives. Any other thing is not my business. Thank you. Thank you. So sometimes it's not just about the successes. There are failures in between and God will help us through it. Right. Okay. So is it true that it is difficult to do business in Nigeria? Absolutely. It requires special grace to do business in Nigeria. What have been your experiences? Um, I mean, the truth of the matter is, for me, what has helped me with doing business in Nigeria is doing whatever I can to be in sync with the, with the Holy Spirit. Do whatever it takes <laughs> to be in sync with the Holy Spirit. Because nothing is as it seems. Nothing. You know, when I first started at Andela, I was very, uh, when I started at Andela, I was very um, young. You know, I was very, I was growing in my faith. And I remember this one incident that was like a baptism of fire. My team, we had grown now. We had a little bit of funding. So we wanted to find a training space. And one agent had introduced me to a guy and said he had an apartment he was leaving. So, and it looked okay. We could take it, we could renovate it. It was what we could afford. Um, we had choked out our old space. So, sorry. So, I went to meet the man. We had a good conversation. He made a lot of mounts. To be fair to him, he said that he has a year left on his uh, thing, which was a lie, on his lease. But that he was going to talk, because he's getting married, he needs to move out. He was going to talk to his landlady. So, we didn't think much of it. 
we just assume that, okay, he has handled it with his landlady. On the appointed day, we moved. I got to the gate <laughs> of the house. My, my team is coming tomorrow. We have interviews planned for people to come in from Monday. So I wanted to quickly come in on that Saturday, set up, so that on Monday we'll be ready for work. I got to the gates. One man came from the boys' quarters and started shouting at us. What are you doing here? This is a we have paid. We have paid the rent to the man, assuming the landlady has been settled. And that was how we didn't have an office and we have interviews on Monday. I have to send invitations that day. All this week taught me a fantastic lesson because in my heart, it has been telling me, this guy, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? I just ignored it and said, it's the cheapest. Let's just do it. Since that day, I don't, I don't do it. I, no matter the decision, no matter how witty it is, I try my best to say, can I, can I come back to you? And some people say, you are slow. You can't make decisions on the go. But I say, look, I need to get approval from my chairman because I know the consequences of not seeking his approval before I do something. And um, I mean, every now and then, whenever I deviate from that, I always regret it. <laughs> I always regret it. So I've learned over the years that, no, I can't make decisions without it. So that's, doing business is very difficult because you can never tell who is telling you the truth. That's the biggest thing, problem we have in Nigeria. It's just, it's not that things are that easy because it's just that whenever you engage somebody, they are telling you what you want to hear. Very few people are willing to tell you the truth. And uh, that has been the challenge. Even down to recruiting people. You recruit somebody, you see they lied on their resume, you know, all sorts. But God, has, God always helps me. And uh, uh, it has made my journey a bit easier. Speaking of resumes, um, how have you found the Nigerian job market? Being a CEO and all that, um, the Nigerian market and the skills that people have and how they can employ those skills into the jobs they have. Because there's usually this discrepancy is like, what they have is not what the job market needs. Yes. So how do we balance that? You see, I think that's the reality, is that there is hardly anybody you will recruit today who will meet your requirements. But the challenge I often have is that very few people are willing to make the sacrifices to learn. Um, you know, I, I do my very best to, to bring on people as early as possible and train. I used to do a lot of that. But... <laughs> Nigerians are too easily impressed with themselves, especially young Nigerians. You know, they do something small. They believe they are experts, and they don't take their time to really learn the work and build their own independent thoughts. So even when we train people, within two years, they want to go and do their own thing, which is okay. I, I don't mind, but I often feel like if people could really take their time to learn, to develop the thought frameworks, if they were not so much in a hurry to achieve some phantom of success, they would be better grounded and they would be able to evolve. Um, especially young people that were lucky enough to get some skill. Uh, there's something, for example, people talk about software development. Something is happening now in the market. Uh, with AI, with um, no code, a lot of developers are out of work. And a lot of them is because, you know, you learned a little bit of JavaScript or CSS, and you went and started trying to take on foreign gigs that keep you busy so you don't develop yourself. Or some, some of people just chop the money and jaye instead of investing in themselves. 
And at the end of the day, they don't amount to anything. Me, as quote-unquote accomplished as I am, I invest so much in my own education every year. I invest so much. I, it's not courses, though. I don't go to Harvard or anything. I don't think of those as important. I go to conferences that are very small. I, I try and meet with important people. Not to build a relationship necessarily all the time. Just to learn from them. Um, I, I, I spend time in the market understanding what everybody's challenges everybody's having. And I do a lot of research and reading. Um, most people don't invest in themselves. Most people are only willing to do the bare minimum to get a job. But what you need to understand is that whatever job you get today, the job description changes every day. Every day. Because the moment I find somebody that can do your job plus X, you are no longer relevant to me. I will change you out. It doesn't matter how good I feel. Which is why it's so important for you to, first of all, lean on the wisdom of God. Because there's nothing, there's nothing that you want to learn that God does not know. <laughs> so he can help you. But invest in yourself. Take time to be ready. Take time to listen to God. If people listened more to God's leading before they made choices, they may not leave a place before a specific time. I think. Can we jam your hands together? I believe we are learning. If you are learning something, please jam your hands together. Sir, there is a question here that I would like you to respond to. We really appreciate you and what you are impacting our lives with, sir. Thank you so much. This question goes does that. How do you balance being a family man and um, being a businessman? How do you balance that, sir? God is helping me. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that I'm anywhere near perfect. <laughs> um, I, for me, though, what I try to do is, um, for now at least, I try to establish some routine. So no matter where we are in the world, on most evenings, when we are not extremely tired, I mean, on most evenings, uh, we, we pray as a family before we go to sleep, no matter where we are in the world. And that helps. Um, I try to be present with my family when I'm with them. Um, so if I've traveled or whatever, if I come home, nothing. I just, I try. <laughs> it doesn't always work. <laughs> but God is helping me. I try to cut off all communication and just be with them. Uh, but the most important thing is really building a strong relationship with your wife. I think that's the, the best. Uh, trying, being a good friend to your wife, working with her, and then also taking those opportunities with the child as well. I have one, one daughter, Karis. Um, and I also um, um, try to get help whenever I can from family members as well, so... Uh, that's how I've been. I'm not by any means a perfect family man. In fact, I'm, I, if there's a worst, <laughs> I'm probably, I'm, I, who knows? I, everybody keeps their own family shrouded, but I'm not ashamed to say that's one of the areas where God is still working on my life. Amen. Can we jam our hands together? Thank you so much, sir, for your honesty. So, when is the best time to start a business? When is the best time to start a business? The truth is, when God tells you, that's the honest truth. But one thing that I know from reading the Bible is that God never commissions men that are unprepared. He never does it. I've never seen him do it. He might anoint you, but he will not commission you until you are ready. And I see a lot of people rush out of school, no net worth, no network <laughs> and they want to build a business they are not prepared they are barely supporting themselves and you want to be responsible for the destinies of men and women with families because that's what it means to run a business 
you don't have the leadership skill, you have not been discipled or too taught, you don't, you don't have the resources, you don't even have a proper understanding of the client's needs, but you want to be CEO. So you finish school and you go and be CEO. Or you say, oh, there's no job. So the only thing I can do is to go and start a business. There's always job. That's one thing I, do, I, I will never understand. There's always job. The problem is, are you willing to take the job and the pay? <laughs> but there's always job. If it's that there is no work to do, that's a lie in this country. You always say, people always say there's unemployment. Yes, but that there, there are no jobs, that's a lie. <laughs> so many people are rushing into business unprepared. I would discourage that. What you, you need to go in prepared. That means you need to have learned, typically have learned under somebody, a good leader. Even if it means you do it at your cost or you do it with a bit of sacrifice. Take that sacrifice. Learn under a good leader who can help you so you can build the skills and knowledge required to be a, a, a productive servant. Thank you so much, sir. Can we jam our hands together for Jesus? Sir, we really appreciate your time. And I believe we are learning and we will apply all what you have learned from here. Sir, how do you separate your capital from your profits? You know, for some, they go into business and with the capital and um, they make profits and they just do what they want to do with the profits. So, sir, how do you separate capital and profits as a business person? Okay. Uh, what I think you mean is how do you separate your, your own personal finance from that of your company? Um, because your profit and your capital are typically together. Uh -huh. It's only one way. Pay yourself a salary. Did you hear what I said? Yes. <laughs> There's only one way. Pay yourself a what? Salary. salary. I never allow myself to get into that trap because it can end you. I don't use profits even. I don't touch profits. I am a cost to the business. <laughs> I, you the CEO, owner of the business, you yourself, you are a cost to the business. You are not just Oka. You are a cost. So I take a salary. It might not be markets. I, in fact, I've never worked in an organization where I was the highest paid. Never. I, I might be the CEO. I've never worked in an organization where I was the highest paid person. So it's, likely not, like, it's not likely to be a fantabulous salary, but it can keep you alive. And you add it to your business cost so that when there is profit... You can make rational decisions <laughs> about the profits. Should I reinvest the profits? Should I take that profit uh, and pay dividends? What should I do with the profits? Should I give it to God? What should I do with the profits? You can make rational decisions with the profits. But always take a salary. That's what I advise business owners. Put yourself there. Even if it's 100K, put yourself there. And then your profit is your profits. And you can now distribute dividends when it makes sense. Thank you so much. Please, let's put our hands together. <laughs> Sir, please, what would you say are the major lessons you have learned on your journey as an entrepreneur? Many, many, many lessons. <laughs> um, let me boil them down to three. Boil them down to three. Um, the first one is that if his presence will not go with you, don't go. Don't go. Any journey, any business where God will not go with you, don't go. You, you will suffer. I'm telling you, from experience, <laughs> you will suffer. It will just be like film trick. Um, that's number one. Number two, you can never build a great business alone. 
ask for help and ask for men and women that will labor with you. I'm always weary when I see a business that only has one man. Even God gave man a helper. Eh? When he created man, he created what? Woman. To help him. So God, when God was establishing his own company, he put two co-founder. Who are you now? Eh? Are you, I mean, you get strength past God. We give man, woman. So you cannot do it by yourself. So I never go into any business alone. Not possible. There are always three in every relationship. God, me, and my partner. <laughs> it's not just marriage. Uh, three is the number of completeness. That's what daddy will say. Eh? So we're always three. At minimum. Uh, we can be more, but at least three. Me, God, and my, and my business partner. Uh -huh. That's number two. Number three. The greatest profits and the greatest purpose will always be found in serving others. If you optimize for your own benefits alone, it will not succeed. If you optimize for, if your business is a source of income to others, your business cannot go down. Andela can never not do well. Even if they don't want to do well, they can never not do well because the number of mothers that have prayed Andela's... In fact, you, everyone cannot stop hearing because some, somebody will come. He's not even earning 80,000 naira. In two and a half years, three years, he has gone to Belgium. He's earning 150,000. You, you think his mother is not praying? He can never go down. <laughs> So even if we say sometimes, we will say, ah, this business, they have lost their way. It's not possible. It will always be there. So if you want to build a business, make sure your business is one that can touch people's lives in a tangible way. Your business will never go down. Thank you so much. Please, let's put our hands together. Let's put our hands together. So you mentioned partnership as a way of building your business to last. So how do we talk, how do we deal with in-house competition, especially with partners in a business? Well, I think one thing I always advise from experience as well is always ask God for insights about anybody you want to go into business with. It's very important. Um, but the other thing I've also noticed about the way God works is that partnerships are not forever. Sometimes the person is there for just a season and it's for both of you to figure that out. That's very, very important. Number three, it's always better if both of you acknowledge God. Always better because it makes decisions easier. Because uh, if the other person is misbehaving, you can pray to God to talk to him. <laughs> you know? And for me, the most important thing in a partnership, servant of the Lord shall not strive. It does not matter who is right or who is wrong. The moment somebody is claiming rights, just leave it for him and go. It does not matter. Leave it for him and go. People will say you are a mumu. You don't know what you are doing. You are just a, you are a fool. And there's nothing that I've not been called now. On the social media, they say I'm a mumu because I resigned. Because I didn't agree with where the company was going. <laughs> it's okay, I'm a, mumu. I'm a mumu. It's better for you to be a mumu for God. Servant of the Lord cannot strive. You will never hear by the grace of God that he took somebody to court because of shares, shares, shares against my own life. Ah. 
It's not possible. Servants of the Lord shall not strive. We cannot fight for earthly possessions. It's not possible. We own too much. We own too much. Please, if you're putting your hands together, put your hands together well. In, in, in any partnership, once somebody says, it's my own, do you want the title? Mm -hmm. eh? you, want the, you want the underwear? Eh? What, anything else? <laughs> because for my own life, I, will not, I cannot do that. Thank you so much. Please put our hands together for him. Thank you so much, sir. So we have a question here from Facebook. And the question says, how do you handle passion and profit? After being convinced that you're in the will of God, but not making the money. So God has directed you, but you're not seeing that you're not making money. It's not being profitable. For example, I love what I do so much and I'm convinced it is the will of God, but I'm not making the kind of money I think I deserve. You don't deserve any money. <laughs> it's not your... It's not, what? Look, if one thing that I had to conquer early... In my, own, in my own work with God is greed. And greed is not just you're asking for too much. It's that you're asking for anything that doesn't come from God. You are working in God's passion for your life. You are, you are, doing, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. You are happy. Why do you want to Give yourself extra load. God is providing for you. And if he's not providing for you, he will. You just need to ask. Me, I always tell God, anything that is outside your provision for my life, I don't want. It did not lead me. I, in fact, I have a principle. Many times, if I get excess money, I, I do my best to get rid of it. I do my best to get rid of it so that it does not tempt me to accumulate. It does not tempt me to accumulate. I'm, a lot of my colleagues are a lot richer. That's why me, I know the meaning of a good name is better than riches. A lot of my colleagues are a lot richer than I am. But for me, I am content. I am content. What I have is what I need. I don't need... I'm using, this, I'm using mommy's car. <laughs> yeah, some of my colleagues they cannot enter I'm using mommy's car that church abandoned I say yeah, let me give me that one let me be managing it I don't need a new car mission work is there the family is there people's school fees are there God's work is there Amen. <laughs> yeah? so I will now leave all that one and go and buy bulletproof car who is looking for me <laughs> what is looking for me now okay. yeah? So, it's just important to be content. Yeah. There's no money you deserve. Everything we receive is by the message of God. Yeah. Learn to trust God for your daily needs. That's one thing that God has really, really worked on me for. I just trust God. If, even as I am, sometimes you'll be shocked if you see my bank account. Aha! How can you have 18,000 naira in your bank account? Yeah. I trust God. And Amen. never, it has never failed me. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, sir. We're almost done. Just two more questions. So this question is, what phrase accurately describes you? Just. It, that one is for other people now. <laughs> <laughs> you can give us one or two. What I'm working towards, I, I, I want to carry Jesus. That's, that's for me. I mean, that's for me my whole life. I want to just carry Jesus everywhere. And, uh, I, I, you know, God has designed that it's in business. Yes. Um, and so that's what we are doing. But for me, I just want to be a follower of Christ. Amen. Carry Jesus everywhere. Amen. Thank you so much. Please let's put our hands together. What are your final words to us? As you? you know, my final words to to you is are the words I started with. Is it is it is good to know Jesus. I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor speaking. Gio did not tell me to tell you. 
I'm talking from my life. It's good to know Jesus. It's good to know Jesus. There is nothing, you know, that is better than knowing Jesus. Thank you so much. We have learned a lot. If you have learned a lot, please put your hands together.